Several years ago, we released a program called Getting Started with Simulation to show pilots how to get the most out of home simulation. We compared X-Plane 11 to Microsoft FSX and its professional descendant, Lockheed's P3D, and we decided that X-Plane was the best choice. But now Microsoft is back with a new flight simulator with a lot of hype, and it looks gorgeous. But is it right for real-world pilots who want to use their computers to practice and stay proficient? Let's take a look at the new sim and see why we think X-Plane 11 is still a better choice. But first, we do need a bit of a disclaimer. We're in the very early days of Microsoft Flight Simulator 2020, and there are basically no third-party add-ons at this point. All of these flight sims rely to some degree on third-party developers to add realism and variety, and there's no doubt that'll be the case for this one. It's not entirely fair to compare a brand new sim to one that's as well established as X-Plane, but that's where we're at right now. Check back in a few months, and things will certainly be different. The 2020 edition of Microsoft Flight Simulator wins here, hands down. You've probably seen pictures and video, and the actual sim lives up to them. It's a revolutionary scenery system which streams in aerial imagery and terrain data from Bing Maps, and then uses advanced artificial intelligence algorithms to place procedurally generated buildings and trees in the right places on the imagery. The result is a world that often looks stunningly photorealistic. Your hometown may be in the middle of nowhere where no scenery developer has ever looked, let alone hand-touched, but it doesn't matter. It'll probably still look spot on. Sure, if you zoom down to street level, your house might not exactly be your house, but we don't fly at street level anyway. Seriously though, your house is in the sim. If you happen to live in or near a major city, there's a good chance your area was generated using photogrammetry. Photogrammetry generates 3D imagery by taking pictures at multiple locations and angles. The result, as seen here in Chicago, is spectacular from typical GA altitudes. One negative is the emission of towers in Microsoft Flight Simulator. Approaching St. Paul downtown airport from here seems fine until you realize you should be headed straight for a 1400 foot tower. X-Plane shows it and Microsoft doesn't. The bottom line though is that you can use the new Microsoft sim to navigate visually. You can practice your solo cross countries in the sim before you do them for real and they should be very familiar once you get in the plane. Or better yet, fly lots of other cross countries and lots of other areas besides your home. It is possible to get high resolution photo based scenery from third parties into X-Plane too. Although it's not as good as Microsoft Flight Simulator scenery, it also looks great and enables visual navigation. The downside to add on photo scenery in X-Plane is that the installation process isn't simple, it takes a long time, and uses literal terabytes of local hard drive space just to cover a few states. Without photo scenery, X-Plane generates a fine, believable world. It's nothing spectacular, but if you're using it for IFR practice, you probably don't care. The default aircraft in Microsoft Flight Simulator handle reasonably well. The 172 flies believably like a 172, at least once you turn down the control sensitivity settings. It likely depends on what controls you're using, but a setting of minus 50% on each axis worked well on both our Honeycomb yoke and Thrustmaster stick. It flies like a light GA single, and the performance numbers are pretty close to a real 172. The 152 flies equally acceptably, and we imagine the Robin DR400 does too, since many of the developers took flight lessons in a Robin. The higher performance aircraft have a few more issues. The G36 Bonanza is woefully underpowered, while the normally aspirated Baron is overpowered. Here's the Baron climbing through 3,000 feet at 18 degrees nose up and nearly 3,000 feet per minute, and later holding its own and still climbing through flight level 280. The trick then is to think of these more as generic aircraft rather than the specific model they represent. The Baron is simply a light GA twin, and the Bonanza a complex, high-performance single. And that's true to some extent for all sim aircraft. If you know your real-life plane well enough, you'll always find things to nitpick. X-Plane's default aircraft aren't perfect either, although we'd rate the X-Plane 172 and Baron flight models as a bit better than their Microsoft versions. The most accurate aircraft come from third-party developers. X-Plane has quality add-ons that span the spectrum of GA aircraft. Microsoft Flight Simulator is too new to have add-ons at this point, but it will. Microsoft's renditions of the various Garmin products only look like their real-life Garmin counterparts, but are lacking in functionality. It's likely they'll get improvements as the sim is updated, but for now they're not useful for serious practice. It's better to ignore the GPS altogether and fly old school with VORs. If you want to practice IFR with modern equipment, the avionics and Microsoft Flight Simulator are a deal breaker for now. X-Plane has Garmin 430, 530, and G1000 systems that are much more functional. 
They're not 100% accurate, but they're usable enough for real-world practice as long as you know the real unit well enough to spot the differences. The best sim avionics come from third-party developers, and as young as the new Microsoft Flight Sim is, developers just haven't had a chance yet. What's yet to be seen is how well the base platform supports advanced avionics. Systems modeling in very simple planes is okay. The more complex the plane, though, the more likely you are to find items missing or incorrectly modeled. Fuel flow actually increases at first when the mixture knob is pulled back before beginning to drop. The audio panel on the 152 is just non-functional, but on the 172 it is. Cowl flaps don't do anything to engine temperatures or cruise speeds, and don't plan on pulling the chute in the SR-22. It's marked as in-op. These are all systems that X-Plane does a pretty good job modeling out of the box. X-Plane also simulates just about any failure you could want to practice, while Microsoft Flight Sim only offers a few. Like everything in Microsoft Flight Sim, airports look great. Unfortunately, they have some serious shortcomings, the most notable being the lack of accurate airport signage. With the exception of a small number of handcrafted airports, taxiway designations are simply wrong, and airport lights and markings often show up in the wrong places, or not at all. If you start all your flights on the runway, that's fine, but there's tremendous value in practicing airport operations with an ATC service like Pilot Edge. X-Plane shines here, but only because of a system that allows users to submit correct airport layouts to be included in the base sim. By now, there have been enough submissions that you'll rarely run into an incorrect airport in X-Plane. It's possible Microsoft might take the same approach to fixing its airports, but we don't know yet. And stay away from the default ATC in any sim, flight sim or X-Plane. Simulated ATC is always pretty bad, and if you're using the sim for serious practice, you must sign up for Pilot Edge for ATC from real, live, highly trained humans. The weather system in Microsoft Flight Simulator 2020 produces some incredible visuals. It also enables real, visual decision making in a way that X-Plane doesn't quite do. You can see storms and rain showers in the distance, for example, and plan to divert around them. But it does have some significant faults, too. First, the real-world weather doesn't seem to consistently match the specifics of the actual weather. It might look about right, but cloud bases can be significantly off, and winds often don't match the METARs exactly. Load up in an area of severe weather, and you may or may not see impressive thunderstorms in the sim. Icing is modeled both visually and aerodynamically, but it's not done realistically. Fly through any small cloud when the temperature is below freezing, and you'll very quickly turn into an ice cube. Even a snow shower on an otherwise VFR day produces the same icy fate. It looks cool, but it's just not realistic. Strangely, you can turn off the aerodynamic effects of icing in the sim, but not the visuals. The options available for setting your own custom weather are also lacking. Here we have cloud bases set at 200 AGL for some instrument approach practice, but the cloud bases are so diffuse that the runway is visible from 1,000 feet. That's clearly a problem. What about lowering the visibility to one half mile to match approach minimums? There's actually no setting for that. You can lower the visibility by adding precipitation, but there's no way to set it to a specific value. For a serious simulator, that's a pretty glaring oversight. X-Plane, on the other hand, has reliably accurate real-world weather conditions and a high level of customization, too. If you've loaded a flight in Microsoft Flight Simulator 2020 and you decide you want to change something, like the aircraft or location, you can only do it by ending the flight entirely and returning to the main menu. That also involves a fairly long wait at a loading screen to get back in. You can't do those things from a top menu like every other previous simulator has allowed. That may be because the interface was designed with a future Xbox release in mind. If you want to reposition the plane to intercept an ILS, you can't do it. There's also no instructor station option, and no equivalent to X-Plane's Plane Maker or World Editor for simple tweaks. You also must have an internet connection to start the sim, and to stream the scenery. If your internet drops out in flight, you can continue, but the scenery will be lower quality. So the new Microsoft Flight Simulator 2020 does have some serious issues when it comes to real-world practice, but we're not saying you should skip it. We've had some incredible experiences with it in the short time it's been out. Nighttime down the Hudson Corridor was spectacular. Visiting small grass strips and seeing them render exactly like the real thing is amazing, and very useful for previewing a new airport. And exploring new areas won't get old. Honestly, if you like flight sims, get both. You can't have too many, right? So be aware that Microsoft Flight Simulator 2020 is not ready for most serious real-world training applications at this point. If you want a sim to use for IFR proficiency, X-Plane 11 is easily the right choice. There's a reason that X-Plane is used as the base for many FAA-approved simulators. 
but don't sleep on Microsoft Flight Simulator. It has significant mainstream attention and a massive user base. That means third-party add-on developers will flock to it, and if history is a guide, they'll create add-ons to fill every need. Combined with updates to the core sim for Microsoft, this could be a very different conversation in just a few short months. Are you using a flight sim for training now? Tell us in the comments which one and how it's working for you.